guest speaker today. And um, uh, he's actually a close friend of mine. His wife is a close friend of my wife's. Uh, he is the director of Chabad of West Parkland, Florida, a popular lecturer in the South Florida Jewish community, a native of Melbourne, Australia. Rabbi Gutnick comes from a long line of rabbis. He earned his rabbinic ordination in 1998 at the Central Lubavitch Yeshiva in New York. And he continued his postgraduate studies at the renowned Koilal Menachem in, in Melbourne, Australia, where he received the diploma in practical rabbinics as well. And while in Australia, he served as an associate rabbi focused on adult education and outreach, which he continued upon, upon arriving in Florida in 2001. And Rabbi Gutnick serves as the director of Chabad of Parkland's educational department and as a faculty member of the Boynton Beach Koilo, in addition to his role as rabbi of the Chabad congregation in West Parkland and its 500 families. Now, I could really go on and on, but I, I think uh, I think uh, Rabbi Gutnick has a lot to say, so I don't want to cut into his time. So uh, we'll just suffice it with that partial uh, list of his accomplishments. And uh, with no further ado, Rabbi Mendy Gutnick. Thank you very much, Rabbi Smith. I really appreciate that. That's very kind of you. I'm not sure where you got that information from, but uh, it looks like um, you've got you've got a lot of exaggerated numbers there. Um, you have probably about 200 families that are involved in our shul regularly at, uh, at Chabad of West Parkland. And actually, I just recently read a study that no one person can know more than 200 people very well. But if you want to maintain close relationships with somebody in your life, the maximum number to do that is 200. If you go beyond that, you're not having wholesome, close, um, direct relationship with them. You know, you can know a lot of people. You can you can have acquaintances. But I found that was interesting because, you know, with Chabad always sending out new emissaries, it's it's uh, there's a lot more Jews to be reached and and to be connected with. So. So yeah, that's uh, that's the number here. But it's very nice to be with you. I see Naomi, I see Rib David, I see uh, Mrs. iPhone. Actually, I, I saw you talking before, but I didn't. You don't. I didn't get your name. Anna. 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 Very nice to to hear from you as well. Sounded like a bit of a Russian accent. Is are you, uh, are you? Are you an old refusenik? Okay, and there with your husband, I assume. And I have Mr. Greenberg over here. Looks like you're outdoors. And uh, Ramosha and Gittel. So yes. welcome. It's it's very nice to be with you all here today. Welcome. On this, on this very special um, Thursday afternoon. Parshas Vayishlach. And that's actually what I'd like to discuss because it's probably one of the most famous Parshas of the Torah. You know, we always say every Torah portion is the most famous when we get up to it. Just like every holiday is the most important holiday as we approach it. And that's something that, as a Jew, we, we love to focus on the moment, the time that we're in at that particular moment. As the Alter Rebbe, first Chabad Rebbe, used to say, that you can, you, you can read the newspapers and look online on the media, but you will not find what's happening in the world through that medium. You'll find what's happening in the world by looking at the Torah portion of the week. You will discover everything you need to know about the world we live in at the moment. So true living with the times is living with what the Torah portion is sharing with us. And it's remarkable because if we've gone through the last, in the last seven or eight weeks, it's amazing how many things we've found, starting with Parshish Noyach when this all, when this all went down and we, we saw Malay Haaretz Hamas and, and we saw like clear indications of everything that was happening in, in the world today, in every week's Torah portion. And, and obviously the main theme has been throughout these weeks is Hashem has promised the Jewish people the land of Israel. It's been given to Abraham and then again to Yitzchak and then again to Yaakov and how it is absolutely imperative for us to recognize that our relationship with Eretz Yisrael is primarily a divine one not just historical, not just military, not just from the United Nations. 
given to us by Hashem, and, and it's been emphasized in these in these portions that we're in, including again this week as Yaakov, who was spending 21 years away from home, escaping his brother Esau, is now told he has to go back home. Why? Because you don't belong in North Turkey and Syria. You belong in Israel. That is your land. That is where you deserve to be, and that's where you belong. And so Yaakov says, okay, I, I have someone that is, is, is threatening to kill me, my brother, but I'll go back. And what I'd like to focus on in, in this story is the name change that Yaakov receives as he's about to go back into Eretz Yisrael after 21 years in exile. And uh, he, he's coming back home and he meets this mysterious angel who he wrestles with all night. And at the conclusion of which he prevails and he says, what now? And the angel says to him, you will no longer be called Yaakov. You will now be called Israel." And uh, he blesses him with that after he says, you know, what is your name? And he says, Yaakov. And he says, you're going to be called Israel now. Then Yaakov turns to the angel and says, okay, what is your name? And he doesn't answer. And that's the, pretty much the end of the story. A very mysterious story. Who was he wrestling? Who was, what was going on over here? Now, before we go into analysis of whether we should be calling Yaakov Yaakov, or whether we should be calling him Yisrael, because Avraham, Abraham also had a name change. And he went from Avram to Avraham. And then we had Sarai turn into Sarah. And we never went back to those original names. We never called them Avram and Sarai again. But Yaakov, we've called many times Yaakov, even after he gets this name change. And sometimes he gets mentioned as Yisrael, but seems to go back and forth. So what is different about this name change as opposed to Avraham and Sarai's name change? Who is this mysterious stranger that is wrestling with him? Why does it say Yaakov reached that place alone? He was there alone. What does that mean he was alone if there was this stranger there with him at the time? Was he alone or was he with the stranger? And, and what was up with asking the stranger to give him a blessing? And he says, he said, after he just wrestled with this guy all night and he prevailed, actually he got his hip socket removed. He got the the injury on, on the hip or the sciatic nerve, which is why we don't eat from the particular part of the animal where the sciatic nerve is. As a direct result of that injury, the Torah says, from now on, Jewish people don't eat from the Gid Hanasha, from that sciatic nerve, which is why very hard to find a good sirloin steak or tenderloin steak that's in a kosher butcher because that's where it is. It's right there in the loin area. So all these questions we have on the story, I'm going to share with you a very interesting insight that is shared um, by many commentaries, but in particular, I'm going to focus on one that was given by the Lubavitcher Rebbe, but we're going to see a... a, a very interesting perspective on this. Before I, I go into that, I just want to share with you, there was once a, a fellow who was uh, having a, a problem sleeping at night. Because you know, as kids, you think there are monsters in your room. But this guy grew up and he never stopped believing that there are monsters in his room, especially under his bed. And he went to therapists and he went to counselors trying to help cure him of this fear of, of having monsters under his bed and everyone went and they told him it's 250 dollars an hour we can help you with this it's based on traumas of your youth and uh he, he didn't have the money to pay for all of that for therapy so he finally decided what do you do when you don't have money to pay for therapy where do you go you go to the rabbi right so the rabbi can give you free therapy. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but it's free, so it's worth a shot. Um, so he goes to the rabbi, and the rabbi tells him, I've got the answer for you. You're worried about monsters under your bed, so chop off the legs of your bed. Chop off the legs of your bed. Your, your, your box spring will go straight on the floor. There won't be any mattresses. There won't be any monsters anymore. He says, brilliant. That's a brilliant idea. Sure enough, he did that. He was never afraid of monsters under his bed anymore. 
Sometimes the answer is, is much more practical than we, than we imagine. I'll tell you another story. There was a guy, a Jewish man on a train, and he was on one of these overnight trains going through Russia, and he needed to, to get off at a stop that the stop was going to be his hometown at four o'clock in the morning. But he was very tired, so he, he asked the conductor, I'm going to lay down in this, in this cabin that has uh, sleeping facilities. Can you wake me up right before we get to my stop? so that I, I won't miss it. So the conductor says, absolutely, I'll wake you up right before we get to the stop at 4 a.m. Now, in his cabin, there was another bed, and there was another passenger who also lay down and went to sleep. That passenger happened to be a Russian general. And he had his fancy cap and his, and his coat with his, with his medals on it and everything else. And so uh, he goes to sleep. And he wakes up, he wakes him up, he comes in to wake him up at four o'clock in the morning, he says, you stop, sir, get up. And he gets up and he gets dressed, but he was so disoriented from waking up in the middle of the night, it was also dark. So instead of putting on his own jacket and clothes and hat, he put on the general's jacket and hat by accident, and he walks off the train. And the whole time when he gets off the train at the station, he sees people are looking at him with respect. Some people are saluting him. He's never, he's never been treated like this before. He doesn't know what's going on. He goes home and he looks in the mirror as soon as he gets home and he sees he's wearing the general's hat and the jacket. And he says, oh no, the conductor woke up the general instead of me. We, we, sometimes, we sometimes have an identity crisis and that's what I'd like to address. Yaakov had an identity crisis. He didn't know who he was. He really didn't know who he was. From birth, he's grabbing at the heel of his brother Esau. And that's why he's given the name Yaakov. The name Yaakov is the name that indicates that he was always looking to grab at Esau's heel. He wanted to be his older brother. He wanted to be taking his older brother's place from very birth. And then it continued on when he sold him the lentil soup. He wanted the birthright. And then he puts on his brother's clothing to get the blessings in a sneaky way from Yitzchak. And then he wears the fur from the goat so he should have hairy arms like Esau. And then he gets the bracha. His whole life, he seems to be obsessed with trying to usurp his brother Esau to get the birthright to become the older brother, to become the one to receive the blessings. And maybe even he's even a little bit jealous of Esau's charisma because he doesn't consider himself a man of the field. He doesn't consider himself a man who knows how to fend for his own abilities in the wilderness. But yet he's in awe somewhat of Aesop's ability to do so. And so you know what happens when somebody is trying to usurp you and trying to replace you and trying to take over your identity? You become very upset. You become very frustrated. It, it makes a lot of sense why Esau was so bothered by Yaakov. Because who wants a younger brother trying to knock you off the position of older brother the, your entire life and become you and take your place? Nobody wants that. So Esau is getting more and more antagonistic towards Yaakov every time he takes over. And that's why he says to Yitzchak, he's tricked me twice. He first time he took... The, the birthright from me with the soup, and now he takes the blessings from my father, a trickery, enough of this kid trying to usurp me and trying to take over who I am. And the truth is, he's not wrong, Esau. Yaakov's desperation to be like Esau it caused him a lot, of, a lot of grief. And so ultimately... When you think about the idea of, of what Yaakov was going through in his life, he was always thinking, the only way I can succeed is if I take the place of my brother Esau. If I get the level of blessings, the level of priority, the level of hierarchy as my brother Esau had. So here he was, 21 years now, living a life where he sort of comes to discover himself a little bit. He realizes, you know what, maybe I do have some strength and ability on my own. I, I have a wife that I love, Rachel. I have another wife that I'm trying to love, Leah. I have 
brought 12 boys and one girl into the world, at least that, that we, the Torah tells us about. I've raised a family, and not only have I raised a family, I've become successful. I've become successful in, in acquiring wealth and acquiring uh, livestock during my years at Lavan, and now I realize that I do have something of an own independent identity that I have as well for myself. And if we look at the situation, as he's about to face Esav, Esav is, is now come to greet him with 400 armed men ready to kill. He didn't forget. Esav was thinking about his brothers usurping him for the last 21 years. And as soon as he has the moment now, he's going to repay that debt and end his younger brother's life. So he will stop being a thorn in his side and preventing him from being who he is. Well, the amazing part of the story happens after this. Yaakov shows up and instead of Esau killing him, Esau embraces him, kisses him, and they end and they part ways like, like loving brothers. Esau goes up to Seir, up to the north. Yaakov is allowed to go back into Eretz Yisrael, into Israel, back home. And they part ways like loving brothers, like nothing ever happened. And the question is, what took place? Here we had Esau clear in his intentions. He was absolutely certain that he was going to kill his brother in this reunion. And all of a sudden, everything changes. Well, I'll tell you, my friends, what changed changed was that Yaakov in this wrestling match came to realize that his identity crisis of who he is and who he was was now resolved. So he comes to this wrestling match and it says, he came alone. It wasn't even anybody who was wrestling. Yaakov came to this wrestling match with himself. Who am I? Am I Yaakov? the one who is grabbing the heel of Esau and always wanting to usurp my brother and take his place. And I'm never feeling like I'm content and I'm good enough unless I can be Esau and get all the blessings and priorities that come with being the older brother. Or am I looking at a new Yaakov now? Am I looking at a Yaakov who has accomplished things, who has built a family, who has what to stand on on their own two feet, proud of who they are. And so he wrestles with himself and he prevails. A little bit of an injury he gets, but ultimately he prevails. And he turns to this angel that he's wrestling and he says, bless me. I want to know who really am I? And the angel says to him, you'll no longer be Yaka, no longer are you going to be the one who is grabbing at the heel of your older brother? You have shown me in this battle that you have prevailed in the struggle of who you are as your own person. You will now be Yisrael. You have struggled with God. You have struggled with me. You have struggled with yourself. And you have prevailed. And you have prevailed. And the word Yisrael is made up of many different parts. Yis, yis, you've wrestled with your own struggle of who you are, your own identity. But furthermore, it has the word Sar. Sar means an officer, a leader. You've come to realize that you are a leader in your own right. You don't need to be a sub anymore. You can be pretty special yourself. You were chosen by Hashem. Hashem spoke to you at Hara Maria when you had a dream there. Hashem spoke to you when you left Lavan's house. Don't you know who you are? You're a gift to this world. You're a leader. Stop trying to be somebody else. You are special because you are you. And his name changes to Yisrael. Now, here's the amazing thing. Do you think this was just a, a dream, some kind of psychological shift that he went through? This was a real change that was apparent even to Esau. Because as soon as Yaakov shows up now as Yisrael, Esau looks at him and says, this is not the brother who was trying to take over me. This is not my little Yaakov who's grabbing at my heel. This is a new guy. 
I respect this guy. He's standing up for himself. He knows who he is. He's not Yaakov anymore. He's Yisrael. And when Esau sees that, the own individual identity that Yaakov now had, and he was not in any way showing or displaying a desire to grab at Esau's cloak, at Esau's clothing, at Esau's identity, he said, I can respect you. I can love you because you are you and I am me. And you're not no longer trying to unthrone me and, and unseat me from my position where I am. It's an amazing thing. We are not called B'nai Yaakov. We're called B'nai Yisrael, children of Israel. We are not called Am Yaakov. We're called Am Yisrael. It's not called Eretz Yaakov. It's called Eretz Yisrael. It is clear that chosen for the name to identify us as a people was going to be the name Yisrael. Why? Because the message here is that our job in this world is not to try to always become Esau and be as strong as Esau and be as powerful as Esau and be the firstborn like Esau. Our job is to be Yisrael, to be who we are, to struggle with ourselves, but ultimately to know that we are Sar, we are the leader, we are the gift that Hashem has given the world, and not to be ashamed of that, and not to be embarrassed of that, and not to keep thinking, well, I'll only be great if I can be an Esau. I'll only be great if I can be more American than the Americans. I'll only be great as many Jews thought in the 1920s, if I could be more German than the Germans. That scares the Gentile. That scares the Esau. I don't want you to become me. Don't try and unseat me from my position. But I'm happy if you are you. And maybe, maybe one of the enigmas of anti-Semitism could be when the Goyim think, are, he, are the Jews trying to take over our position? Are they trying to be more Goyim than the Goyim? Are they trying to say we can become all the leaders in your spheres, in your world? So I'm going to tell you, this goes back a few, a few generations before the story of Yaakov, and it was the story of Lot in Sodom. He went to Sodom thinking, I can make it. I can be successful in the upper echelons of society at the time that was Sodom. Sodom was considered to be the, the highest form of civilization. They were the wealthiest, they were the most knowledgeable, they were the, the, the considered to be the up and up of, of society in those days. Not moral, not, not very uh proper in their behavior, obviously. That's why they were destroyed, but they were considered the the uh the upper echelon. And it turns out oh, the low, yes. Could you explain maybe? What could it be in uh, Yaakov's time that he would have been jealous of? Like, what did his brother have that maybe when he was younger until this moment where he won over, but till that moment that he was jealous, like, what would what could he have been jealous of? What was Esau uh, su more successful that in his mind was worth, su was considered a success? Like, how? How could you explain? I mean, there's a brilliant this what you're sharing with us is 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 brilliant is a is a brilliant interpretation. Uh, it's incredible, but I, I'm just so wondering. I'll, if go, you could I'll go a little. Them. I'll go a little bit deeper. I'll expound on this a little bit because ultimately, we our strength as Jews has always been Torah study, prayer, mitzvot, connection to God. And sometimes when a Jew is out in the world, we think that's not really our place that we belong. We don't really belong in a place where there's a lot of materialism. There's, that, that's a dangerous place for a Jew. We can become affected by all the mundane and physical influences. However, ultimately, the real goal of being in this world is to create a dirabatachtonim a place where God feels comfortable in the mundane, in the physical. Quick story, the Rebbe once went to visit Camp Ban Yisrael in the 1950s, and he stopped by all the places in the camp where the kids were very excited to see the Rebbe come visit. And he stopped by the canteen, 
And the canteen had a sign where they sold all the snacks and the food. It had a sign. And the sign said, money is the root of all evil. Leave your evil here with us. It was a cute sign, you know. But the Rebbe didn't like it. The Rebbe said, the money is not the root of all evil. It's the root of all good. Right? And that line succinctly summarizes the, 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 the challenge that we face as Jews. We sometimes feel like I can be a good Jew in shul. I can be a good Jew at the base medrash studying Torah. I could be a good Jew on Yom Tov and on Shabbos. But what about during the week when I have to engage in, in regular mundane activities and deal with money and deal with bills and deal with, with, with things that are, are not holy, at least not apparently holy. And the Torah says to us, and this is really the main mission of Judaism, that to be an angel, I didn't need a world. To be a, a tzaddik in a fur coat, so to speak, you're keeping yourself warm. I didn't need to send you down to the world for that. I sent you down to light a fire. I sent you down to make this physical world into a place where God feels comfortable. You know, other religions, they believe the whole purpose of this world is go to heaven. Judaism believes that the whole purpose of this world is to bring heaven down to earth. That became the mission of what a Jew needs to do. But that's a bit scary. It's a bit intimidating. I'm supposed to go out to work and, and through all the mitzvahs in the Torah of engaging ethically in business and being kind to my co-workers and being good and honest to my customers. That, that's not easy. But that ultimately is the mission of a Jew. Now for Yaakov, he said, I'm really good at being in it. I'm really good at studying Torah. I'm really good at praying. I, I know that that's my strength. But I look at Esau and I see the potential that he has to go out into the world and to conquer it. He has mastery over the world, especially the material world. He's a great hunter. He's a great fieldsman. He's somebody who is a, no, he's doing it wrong. He's doing it in a way of violence and intimidation and, 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 and not refinement. But he was still looking at that goal and that mission as being something that he only could dream about and could only think, if only I had those ace of qualities to be able to go out and really make this world into a home for God by engaging in the physical world and bringing it into holiness. That was something that Yaakov looked at and said, that's Esau's gift. On top of that, he also realized that Esau was the firstborn it was the firstborn, and with the firstborn comes certain privileges and certain uh, certain gifts and certain blessings that he wanted to have those blessings so that he could be able to receive all of the first and, and prioritized um, blessings from God as well. And so that was something he wanted to get from the outset. He wanted to get that firstborn position so he could be the, the, uh, the opportune receiver of all of God's blessings that would go to the firstborn. Ultimately, that was what he felt would be the continuation of the Jewish people, the continuation of Abraham and Yitzchak would come through the firstborn. Interestingly, we do get the name firstborn, but it was only after we earned it. B'ni B'chari Yisrael was what God referred to the Jewish people after being slaves in Egypt for 200 years. Finally, they had earned that right of, of being the firstborn, being the chosen ones, being the ones who Hashem then chose to give the Torah to. That's a little bit of the, maybe some of the deeper perspective on both ends as to why Yaakov was always trying to get that a self position. Can yes. I ask a question? Sure, please, Ben. I, wa I wanted to ask if, if Esau saw that he got the name Israel just on his face or on his looks, Anyhow, he did get that name, and and why are people still? Why is he still called Yaakov a few times? Oh, that's very good. So we're going to get back to that at the at the uh, conclusion of this. We're going to get back to why why he still had the name Yaakov tagged onto him if he did successfully wrestle with himself and successfully found his own unique identity. And right. didn't need to become an of anymore. We'll find out why Yaakov sometimes. I have one more question. Sure. I think that when Abraham was told 
to leave his home. He didn't say you're going to go to Eretz Israel. But I think Hashem had already show you. in mind to call somebody that will be worthy to call him Israel. He just tells him, you go to the land that I tell you. Because he saves that name for somebody that's worthy. At that point, Abraham was not for, uh, worthy yet. But later on, he might have been. Yeah. So I think true. the name was in God's mind from the that, beginning. That was also that was also the test. The test for Abraham was, are you going to go just on a journey without knowing the destination? But yes, there's, 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 part, there's a process there that Hashem was waiting to see if they, he would indeed be worthy of receiving the whole right. land. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good, very good. So I'll, I'll just share with you a, an anecdote that Rabbi Dr. Tversky, the well-known psychiatrist and rabbi from Pittsburgh, shared that he was once on a bus and there was a Jewish lady, an old, old Jewish lady, that looked at him and the whole time she was looking at him with, with disdain, with like very disapproving. And Rabbi Tversky was a Hasidic looking Jew with a long white beard and he wore a black hat and he had white payers and he wore a black coat. And this lady's looking at him, shaking her head the whole time. <laughs> and finally, she says to him, you're an embarrassment to Mr. Busher. You're an embarrassment. What are you still doing wearing these ancient clothes of the old country? We're in America today. People are laughing at you. Can't you dress like a normal person? Put on at least a regular <laughs> shirt. Take off that ridiculous hat. Put your payers away. What are you doing? We're in America now. Don't stick out like a sore thumb and look like an idiot. That got us in a lot of trouble in the past. Can't you just fit in and be like the rest of us and stop being this old, ancient, archaic religion? So he's listening, smiling the whole time. And then he looks over to her and he says, I'm really sorry. I don't understand your verbiage. You see, I'm Amish. <laughs> And she says, oh, you're Amish. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I have to tell you, I have tremendous respect for your people. How you've held on to your traditions and your customs despite the surroundings. It is admirable. And I am completely in awe of how you have maintained and respected your ways of the past. And Rabbi Tversky looks at her and says, finished Amish. I'm actually Jewish. But if I would have been Amish, you'd have respect for me. Huh? But because I'm Jewish, you can't stand me. You're embarrassed by me. Maybe it's you who need to take a good look at yourself. See, Yaakov, in his desire to become Esau, was starting to have a, a problem. Because when you want to be somebody else, you're basically admitting that you're a little bit embarrassed of who you are. And you're not proud of who you are. You're a little bit ashamed. We think about how many times Jewish people have felt a little bit ashamed of their own religion. Even if you hear the word chosen, people say, you're the chosen people. So many Jews have said to me, Rabbi, don't, don't, don't push that chosen people thing. We don't need to make a big deal about that. You're embarrassed to be chosen, okay? So then you want to be just like everybody else. So this is part of the problem that we've had throughout Golos, throughout exile, is we said, if only we could be like everybody else and fit in with everybody else. Even Theodore Herzl said, if we could just have a land like everybody else and not be any different, we'd be a democracy, we'd be a social land, socialist land, we don't have to stand out too much. We'd be accepted by everybody. We'd be okay. But the truth of the matter is, Rabbi Tversky revealed something about that. You have respect for others, but you don't have respect for yourself. This is, this is something that causes a lot of issues with us and causes a lot of issues with those who we're trying to be like. And so... One of the first things that the Jew needs to know is that they are Yisrael and not Yaakov. Now, 
sometimes in answer to your question of why we're still called Yaakov, sometimes there are moments where we still are Yaakov. We still have to recognize that we are lacking. We still have to recognize that maybe there's an area of our life that we should feel humble and a little bit diminished. Yaakov represents in Hasidic teachings, represents the service of a servant, of somebody who feels small, who feels insufficient on their own, and they're doing so because they're commanded to do so by the master. And this is really the element of Yaakov, not to feel too great about their own identity and to have the subservience and the submission to say, I surrender to a greater cause. But then there's the element of Yisrael, which is the times like now in Jewish history, where we need to feel proud and we need to feel strong and we need to recognize and remember who we are, what we stand for, and how we need to be aligned to the nations. When someone says to me, Rabbi, I'm thinking to switch my mezuzah to the inside of my door because I'm worried about the neighbors and what they're going to say, I say, no, now you need to be Yisrael. Now you need to be proud of who you are and know that you have an identity that needs to be shared with the world now more than ever. You know, in Israel, they, they have a few things that are advantages over Jews in America. They have Jewish names. Everybody has Jewish names. Even the most secular politicians, like Yossi Lapid and, and Benny Gunz, or whatever, whoever they are, they've got Jewish names. They speak Hebrew language. And they do. They learn Torah. Every Jew in Israel knows Tanakh. Even the secular, even the secular Jews in Israel know more than some religious Jews in America. They've managed to find that Yisrael, their own identity, which is part of the name of Israel, is worth accentuating and worth holding up as a banner of pride as to my behavior, my identity is, is real and strong. The Jews in America have a big Yaakov problem. We have a problem that we've, for many generations, tried to pursue the American dream and fit into the American way of life. Now, there's nothing wrong with respecting America, loving the fact that we live in a country that allows us to practice our Judaism freely and has the First Amendment that we can, we can practice and say everything that we want and have the freedom to be who we want. And that's a beautiful thing. But at the same time, when we talk about freedom, we don't say just to be free, to be like those who are in that country, but it's to be free to be like ourselves. If you actually think about when the Yidin left Mitzrayim, there was this, a, a, a very famous line that is used by all the people who tell the story of the Exodus from Egypt, and that is, let my people go. That's what Moshe said to Pharaoh, let my people go, let my people go. But if you look in the Torah, that's only half the line. It's not the whole line. The whole line is, let my people go, shalach et ami, avduni, so that they will serve me. There's no point being free just to be free. Right? Americans get drunk on that a little bit. That we are, oh, we're free. Freedom is everything. Freedom so that you can practice your own identity, so that you can be true to yourself. Not just to be free, shalach et ami, avduni, so you will serve God. The freedom from Egypt wasn't just that you shouldn't be slaves anymore. It's so that you will have success in being your own special, unique self. That's what America has gifted us. Not to become completely lost in the melting pot of society, but to stand and be strong in who we are. Just to speak of an interesting anecdote, remember 1991, 1992, when apartheid fell in, in South Africa. Obviously, the big proponent of that, the big winner of that was Nelson Mandela. He had a wife whose name was Winnie Mandela. So after they, they got their freedom and apartheid was stripped away from the political system, he actually became the first black president there. She actually lost her mind. She went, she went crazy, and it's well known. She, she, she lost the plot. And, and and one of the explanations given as to why she went 
a little bit a little bit crazy, a little bit insane, was that her entire existence, her entire life and mission was to bring about freedom, was to bring about freedom for the for the black Africans. Once they achieved that, she had nothing to live for. She had no mission or purpose anymore. She got freedom. She got freedom. The dangers of having freedom, but not using it for a purpose and a mission that you were given by Hashem is useless. It's pointless. We have a gift here, and that is that we can be more Jewish than any other place in the world. And history for 2,000 years, obviously outside of Eretz Yisrael. But what are we going to do with that? Are we going to choose to be like Lot and blend into Sodom and blend into the culture of the place that we're in, thinking, I finally made it. Lot became a chief justice in Sodom. He became one of the highest ranking officials in Sodom. He really made it in that society. And he thought, wow, I invested 25 years in this place, and it's finally paying off. I made it to become a big macher in this place. Yeah, you know what happened? The Avram and the angels come and say, look, we've got to get out of here. This place is getting destroyed. You know what happens? He goes up to the people who are gathered outside his house, and he starts to tell them about the, they should really listen to him and hear what he's going to say because, you know, they, they're going to get destroyed soon. And they look at him and they say, you're telling us what to do? You're an outsider. You're not one of us. You're a foreigner. You're a stranger. You never belonged here. You never deserved to be here. We're going to kill you. Worse than we're going to kill the guests. And Lake thinks about that. And says, what? After 25 years, I've given my heart and soul to this place. And now you call me a dirty Jew? You call me a stranger? You call me a foreigner? I thought I made it. And then he goes to his sons-in-laws. And his sons-in-law, they they laugh in his face. They say, ah, oh, you, you think you're telling us something of interest and importance? Get out of here. They call him a joker. They call him a loser. They call him a weirdo. They said, you don't belong here. All of a sudden, Asa, all of a sudden, Lot realizes in Sodom, all his hard work of trying to become more of a sodomite than anyone in Sodom has backfired, and they never really accepted him. They never wanted him there. And he only realized this now, after giving his heart and soul. So it says in the Torah, Vayis Mahama, there's a Shalshelis, which is a very unique cantorial tune on the, on, the, on the Torah, that he delays, he delays, he's, 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 he's not sure what to do. He can't give up 25 years of his life just like that. But on the other hand, he realizes they never, they never accepted him. He never amounted to anything. This is sometimes how a Jew feels today. They think and look and see Harvard and UPenn and, and Columbia and, and Yale turning on the Jewish people. And they think, wait a second, we made it. We became those institutions. We became the heads of those places. And now they're turning on us, the Jew. We made them what they are. And not only that, other places, for example, for example, when you think about how much the Jewish people have helped other minority causes, whether it's the Black Lives Matter or whether it's the other places that the Jews were on the front lines of ensuring that they had their voices heard, and now they turn on us and say, yeah, Jews, get out of here. You guys are baby killers. You guys are murderers. You guys are... And we're like, wait a second. We thought you loved us. We thought you accepted us. And we realized that those places that we were trying to be like Asa, they never liked that. They never wanted us to be like them. They wanted us to be like us. They are respecting a Jew who stands up and says, you're, you're a Jew and you're proud of being Jewish, we can respect that. We can, we can acknowledge that you have a special, unique role to play. But if you try and cre create your identity as our identity, uh, we, we don't want that. And it's funny because it happened, it happened in Germany too in the 1920s when you had Heinrich Heine and you had uh, 
You had the, the, the uh, Walter Rathenau was actually a, a you know, minister. You had people who, who had become more German than Germans. 97% of Germans assimilate into German culture. And, and, and somehow backfired on all of them. Because Hitler went and found all of the Jews, no matter how assimilated they were, don't try and take over our place. So I think the message is that, yes, there are certain times we remember that we're Yaakov, and, and we need to have the humility to know that we are doing just what Hashem wants us to do. And that there are times we have to maintain that humility, not to allow that to make us feel like we're too great and too important and too special. And know that we do have room to grow and we are just a small nation among 70 wolves. We are just a small drop in the bucket when you look at the whole world. But at the same time, the name Israel, which was given to the Jewish people, was given to the land of Eretz Yisrael, was given to the nation, is a sign and a clear indication of who we need to be. We need to stand strong and stand proud and stand tall to say that we are Jewish. We have the Torah. We're not ashamed of it. We don't need to become anybody else. And then, ultimately, when we have that sense of pride, Asav of the world will probably look at us with more respect and more admiration when we learn to admire ourselves. If we admire Israel, the nation will come, the nations will come to admire Israel. And I want to just give you a little anecdote that, that pertains to this in Israel itself. Goldmeyer was once asked why, in all the negotiations, that they're being asked to really give up some of the land that they got in 1967, why they're not talking about giving up Jerusalem, not talking about giving up Yerushalayim, that everyone in the world recognizes that Yerushalayim is the, land, is the city of the Jew, and that's the Western Wall, and that's where the Temple Mount was, and that belongs to the Jews. And so it was never on the table that Yerushalayim should be compromised upon. And she said the reason why they're not putting any pressure on us with Jerusalem because we never acquiesced. We never admitted to them that Jerusalem is on the table. We ourselves said Yerushalayim is our home. Other parts of Israel, when we said, okay, maybe we give up this, we give up that, what are they going to be more from? They're going to be more religious than us. If we're willing to talk about negotiating on that, and of course, the rest of the world is going to say, let's talk about giving up that land. You yourself brought that up. But she said, smartly so, the moment we start to talk about Yerushalayim is also being negotiable, the rest of the world will jump on that and say, well, then you should also give away East Jerusalem and you should also give away parts of those areas. If we would stand strong and tell the world, I know that you're around us, but this is our land and this is belongs to the Jewish people for all time and for all eternity. And it's not up for discussion. Anything else can be up for discussion. We can talk about living peacefully within our borders. We can talk about living peacefully outside our borders. But if the Jew like Ben-Gurion at the Peel Commission would hold up the Bible because Ben-Gurion was challenged, you come from Plonsk, Poland. What are you doing taking a land that these Arabs have been in for many generations. He realized his best response was to hold up a Bible, to hold up a Chumash, and he said to the Peel Commission, Lord Peel, you believe in the Bible. You're a, you're a faithful Christian. You know what it says in here, that God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people, regardless if I was in Poland or my grandparents were in Poland. This was always our land, and you cannot deny it. <laughs> Three billion people in a few weeks will be celebrating the birthday of a Jew who was born in Eretz Israel, in Beis Lechem. So how can they now say our rights to the land only began in 1948? Mm -hmm. If we recognize it ourselves, if we show them the Torah, which they many believe in, and say, this is our land because God said so. And we're strong about it. And we recognize Yisrael is Yisrael. We don't have to try and become like Asaph. Then Asaph says, all right, I respect that. 
I will respect that. And so let us hope and pray that at this time, we're able to show and influence those around us to show more Jewish pride. As we come up to Hanukkah, we put the menorah by our windows, by our doors, and we show the world we are the nation of light. We are Israel. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We have so much to be proud of. We will not self-shame. We will not self-denigrate. We'll teach our children that we, as a people, won't ever go into hiding, won't ever be ashamed of our heritage. And then the world will learn to respect us as well, as they have at times when we've shown that kind of Yisrael pride. Can't let it get to our heads too much. That's why sometimes there's an element of Yaakov that needs to be in our avoda as well. But it's Yisrael that's the call of the hour. Yes, Ben. Um, I wanted to say one more thing. About 20 years ago, I wrote an article about the change of name for Yaakov. One of the things that I wrote was that Hashem didn't want us to be followers. He always said, you have to be the leaders. You have to be the light to the world. And the name of Yaakov means to follow. So that was one of the reasons he had to change his name. What it means is, is that it's not easy for us. Naturally, we might be more of Yaakov. That's, that's part of our disposition as well. But Maybe we have to struggle, we have to wrestle. And, the, and the, the, the struggle will never end. We're not we're not actually called the people of Vatuchal, which means the people who prevail. We're called the people of Yisrael who struggle because we're constantly struggling with this. We're constantly trying to trying to overcome this particular challenge of the the dichotomy of being in a world, but also being higher than the world. I also to bring, wrote two yeah. meanings to the name Israel at that time, and it was Yesh El and Is Yeshar El. So we have a, an honest God, and we are part partners with God. Yep, that's right. But it's not going to be easy, Sarissa. We're going to have to struggle. It never with it. was easy, and it's yeah. probably not going to be easy. That's right. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? I want to wish uh, you on mute, Rabbi Smith. You're on mute. Can I, I was, can I uh, ask you for your name because I was late and didn't get the name? My name is is Mandy Goodnick, Rabbi in Parkland, Florida. Rabbi Mandy Goodnick. Goodnick, okay, it's a good name. <laughs> yeah. Shikaya. Thank you very much. I want to wish you a happy Hanukkah, a happy Yutes Kisle, which is a very special holiday in the Hasidic calendar, which is the Shabbos. And it's a time for renewal, it's a time for, for pride, it's a time for light over darkness. And may we see it in a revealed way. Thank you very, very much. Uh, that was Thank an exceptional you. insight. Thank you. Uh, really uh, uh, brilliant uh, concept um, and uh, so apropos for today and what's going on in the world. And of course, we uh, were constantly praying and davening for the hostages. They should all be freed and all those uh, yidden that are wounded should be healed and uh, the Hamas should all be destroyed immediately completely, Yamach Shemam Zichram, they should completely be eradicated, and uh, the entire, any, all the negativity and uh, um, uh, uh, th impurities should be uh, removed from the face of the earth, and so especially now, if this is a special time of, uh, we're going to have Yudas Kislev, which is a Hasidic holiday, holiday of light, the whole month of Kislev is, uh, the Kislev is full of light with Hanukkah. This also has the Hasidic holiday, which uh, we're going to be celebrating over Shabbos. So may we all uh, be inspired to connect to Hashem in a stronger way, especially with all the all of our learning. And um, uh, everyone, uh, 
If I don't see you uh, on tomorrow's uh, Zoom, you should all have a, a wonderful Shabbos. Zayigazont. Thank you, Rabbi. Good that this was incredible, really incredible. Very welcome. Rabbi Very welcome. Thank, Thank you. you.